Well, you already know my name, so I'm not going to repeat it. I am going to tell you about a story that something that happened to us a few years ago at our organization called crossexamine.org. We do this here in the States and abroad. We give evidence of why Christianity is true. And we actually got a phone call from a very distressed father. And he was telling us that his daughter, who was the top Christian student at her high school, that had won a bunch of scholarships to go and win the Campus for Christ, decided to go to UNC Chapel Hill to win the Campus for Christ. And what happened was that within four weeks of her being there, she called her dad and she said, Dad, I don't believe in God anymore. And dad was like, what? I don't be- you don't believe in God anymore? What happened? And in, 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 in his mind, he was like, she hasn't been able to process all the evidence for Christianity. We raised her in a Christian home. We gave her good moral foundations. She's got all the opportunities in the world, and now she does not believe in God. And she says, well, my New Testament teacher told me that nobody knows who wrote the Gospels, that there are more errors in the Gospels, that there are words, and that uh, Christianity is not true, that there are very versions of the Bible. So that's why I don't believe in God anymore. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think this is normal or do you think this is, this doesn't happen to us often? It's very normal. It's happening all over the U.S. And interestingly enough, as I was uh, coming here, um, I was talking to uh, a fella, and he was telling me that uh, he is from Arizona, and I told him that I went to Sonora, Mexico, and I actually went to a university to give a talk like this, and I got kicked out. So this is not only happening here in the States, it's happening everywhere. So actually, the statistics show that four, uh, three out of four students, Christian students, to go to university, leave the faith before they come back home. Three out of four. So imagine, this is not just anybody. These are kids who are raised in the church. They lose their faith when they go to college because they're being indoctrinated. And one of the biggest questions, if not the biggest question that they face, is usually the problem of evil. Now, the problem of evil is used against the existence of God. But what if that argument that is used against God will actually prove that he exists. Most atheists use arguments like problem of evil, morality, science, and reason to argue against God. But what we're going to do today here is we're going to see that these arguments, especially the argument of evil and objective morality, show that God exists. So we're going to flip the tortilla you know, for them. All right. So the question is, all all these arguments in favor of atheism. And what we would say is, no, these arguments are actually stolen from God to show that he does not exist. In other words, just to, to, to give you the too long didn't read, these arguments show that God exists in this, 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 these features of reality can only exist and God exists. In other words, atheists are stealing from God in order to argue against them, right? So we actually have a list of things that need to exist, that, 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 that exist because God exists, that atheists can avail themselves of to show that God doesn't exist. There's the law of causality, reason, information, morality, evil, in science. Now we all, we want to go through all of them, but we're only going to touch on morality and evil. All right. And what we're going to do here is the following. Okay. We need to understand first that atheists are materialists. Most atheists, not all of them, but most atheists. But all these aspects of reality have an immaterial foundation, as Eric was talking about, your mind and other things like intentionality, morality, et cetera, you know. In material foundation based on God, therefore, when atheists reference any of them to support their atheism, they are stealing from God in order to argue against them. 
right? We're going to focus, like I said, on evil and morality today. And it is a reality that the vast majority of atheists subscribe to what is commonly called as moral relativism, which means that morality is based or influenced by personal feelings, taste, or opinions. It is not objective, which is contrary to what we find in the scriptures. Aside from this, atheists usually cite not only that evil exists in the world as an argument against God, but also accuse God of being immoral. How many of us have heard that over and over again, that they cannot believe in the God of the Bible because of all the atrocities that we find in the Old Testament, right? So now let's analyze one of the old, oldest arguments uh, against God. Uh, it is, is, uh, this is pretty, pretty common. You've heard it. If God is all-powerful, good, and all-knowing, then he can and will prevent evil. It is evident that there is evil in the world. Therefore, the conclusion is that an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good God does not exist. So at the face of it, you'll see that this could be persuasive for many people. It's compelling, and uh, the argument of pain and suffering, and the argument of evil, is one that is loaded with emotional uh, con connotations. Everybody here has gone through some sort of suffering, pain of evil done to them. And they will, you guys will suffer uh, evil, pain in um, your life and the rest of your life. That's just the way it is. We live in a broken world until the Lord's return. So um, this is the kind of argument that kind of pull on your heartstrings. And you got to make sure that you know how to answer it. All right. So we have Mr. Richard Dawkins. He was uh, an evolutionary, he is still an evolutionary biologist. And in his book, The God Delusion, he says the following, and I think his rhetoric is very powerful. He says, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction, jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving, control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, philicidal, pestilential, me megalomaniac, maniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Now you guys got to give me props for that because English is my second language. Amen. <laughs> so you see that he is very good at rhetoric. Anybody who reads this is going to be like, wow. Because we see what we find in the Old Testament. The uh, genocide of the Canaanites, right? We see all these laws, all these decisions that God made to wipe out certain uh, groups of people. So... Um, Dawkins believed that there is right or wrong. But the question that we should all be asking ourselves is, where does our moral compass point? And I'm going to ask a question here. And if somebody has seen this talk before, please don't spoil it for the rest of us. I'm going to ask you all, who is this beautiful lady here in the picture? Does anybody know? See, take a minute to see if you recognize her. I know that the picture is a little blurry, but do you know who she is? Never seen it before. No? Okay. Let me ask you another question. Who are these children and what's the relationship these children and these men have with uh, her? Anybody knows? No? You're like, man, you showed me pictures of random people, man. I'm wondering <laughs> if the next talk you're going to pull my picture out of Facebook. All right. Well, this is, this is simple. This is uh, my family. This is my aunt and uncle. We, I actually took the picture at Universal uh, 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 Studios. I think we were in Florida. But uh, a few years ago, I was in my desk. I used to run a used car lot. That's why I went to apologetics because I could sell you anything. So <laughs> might as well. I saw, I saw Eric his soul, and I'm not talking about the car. Okay. Uh, um, actually, I was sitting in, it was 945, um, more or less, September 4, 2014. And I'm sitting there just chilling. I told you to turn your thing off. And that's the first thing I did, man. You guys pay attention, please. 
And uh, it was September 4, 2014. And uh, I'm in my desk. It's 9.43. It's one of those uh, impact events. So I pick up the phone rings and I pick up the phone. And it's my sister, uh, Rosalva. Well, actually, I picked up from uh, the airport uh, this Wednesday. I haven't seen her in four and a half years. And she's hysterically screaming. She said, Jorge, please, please call your aunt Shirley. Something is happening. And I was talking to her. And um, all of a sudden, she started screaming. And she says, he's coming, he's coming. And then she started, I heard a commotion on the phone. And I didn't know what to do. And I heard a loud bang. And complete silence. She tried to call again. And she just won't pick up the phone. So I said, I'm going to call the police. I don't know what's going on. I'm going to give the address where they're going to be. And then I'm going to get in my car and I'm going to see what's happening. I get in my car, head to the interstate. It take about 25 minutes to get to the place where she worked from where I was. And the phone rings again. And now it's my uncle. I pick up the phone and I say, hey, Carmelo, good morning. And he Just like any other morning, he says, hey, good morning. I say, how can I help you? He said, well, I'm calling you because I just shot your aunt to the chest. And I want you to tell the police where they can find my body because I'm going to go and hang myself. Thank you. And he hanged up. It is just something that I don't wish to anybody. But in that morning, I was, I was driving. I was doing about 100 on the highway, praying and hoping that my aunt was still alive. I called the police, and I told the police what my uncle said, right? And uh, it was just uh, like a scene from a horror movie. I got there. She's laying on the floor in the pool of blood. You see in the actual uh, TV news coverage of that incident. And uh, at that time, I was a single father with full custody of my two children who were five and four. You saw uh, that picture. And they were uh, four and five. And my aunt was the only person close to me here in the States. I'd gone through a very rough divorce. um, And uh, that was all, you know, before I came to Christ. And uh, I was starting my life as a believer. I think I've been a believer for about 10 years now. And uh, this was uh, something that really shook my faith. I had to identify both bodies and they even closed down the schools because they didn't know if my uh, uncle was going to go in. Because my uncle, the one who committed this crime, was my babysitter. He picked my kids up from school every day and dropped them off. So when you uh, are in a... In the face of this, you you ask, how is it that a good God exists? How he can let this happen? I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what things uh, are to come now when stuff like this happens. And then I get to my house, right, where I I live, and he's just hung himself in the backyard. Right? So now what I'm going to tell my kids that the only grandparents that they know are gone and that they, 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 they died one at the hands of the other? Where was God there? What I'm going to tell them, that their aunt is gone? She was like grandma and mom. Because I was a single father at the time. Right? But according to Dr. Dawkins, <laughs> it doesn't matter, Right? Because in the universe of electrons and selfish genes, physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt. Other people are going to get lucky. And you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. The universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect. If there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. DNA neither cares, nor knows, DNA just is. And we danced to his music. My uncle was dancing to the music of his DNA. Ain't that something? Hmm? Imagine that I had to go and tell my kids that. That there is no hope. That 
that this happened just because, you know, my uncle decided to dance to the, to the rhythm of his DNA. Actually, let's take it one step further. Let's look at the Holocaust. Millions of people. And they were normal people, the ones that were running these camps, the ones that were doing this mass shooting. People like you and me. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to know that you're Auschwitz and Abel. You have a little Hitler living inside of yourself. You have the capacity for evil. These inhuman things that you're seeing right now are not inhuman. That's exactly what humans do. That's what we do. We have a sinful, corrupted nature to lead us to do things like that. You know, but if we believe in materialism and we believe what someone like Dawkins believes, then evil is just an illusion. You have no other way around. But as uh, C.S. Lewis said when he was an atheist, he says, as an atheist, my argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust, but how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line what was i comparing this universe with when i called it unjust and you find that in his book mere christianity we all should read that two or three times a year it's a good reminder it's definitely great book uh, but this is true and what he's saying is that evil requires good and good requires god there is no ultimate, if there is no ultimate good, and that's what we call God, there is no good. It cannot be objectively. And to show objective morality, it's really not that difficult. There are some ethical truths that are easier and more secure, philosophical truths than scientific truths. You know, we have different models for, let's say, something like the electron. But if I ask you if raping a baby for fun is evil you have one answer or you need psychological help what about grandma you know uh, it's the same grandma that uh, uh, Eric was talking about before she ate the cake imagine if you push her down the stairs will that be objectively evil and of course you can conclude that that is we can all agree if you're mentally sane, right? But uh, even Dr. Dawkins goes into this and he says, he says, look what he says here, okay? He used the word unjust. That's the same quote what we read earlier. He says that God is unjust. Of all the things that he did in the Old Testament. But this word right here, unjust, in his worldview, doesn't fit. Because for him, we're only dancing to our DNA. And if God uh, is God, right, um, then he is the standard of morality. But if Dawkins is complaining about what we find in scriptures, and he is a materialist, he's a determinist, he cannot say that anything is just and unjust because morality is just subjective. So he's actually committing intellectual crimes. He's stealing the standard of morality from God to argue against them. This quote refutes him masterfully and is very, very profound. And I'm just going to read it out loud. He says, when you say there is too much evil in this world, you assume there's good. When you assume there's good, you assume there is such a thing as a moral law on the basis of which to differentiate between good and evil. But if you assume a moral law, you must posit a moral lawgiver. But that's who you're trying to disprove and not prove because if there is no moral lawgiver, there is no moral law. If there is no moral law, there is no good. If there is no good, there is no evil. So the accusation evaporates. You got to have an objective standard of morality in order to have a problem of evil. And the thing is that you can have good without evil. In other words, you can have um, sun without shadows. 
but the shadows prove the sunshine. You can have good without evil, but you cannot have evil without good. And in order to have good, you've got to have ultimate good. Because if not, whatever you call good is subjective. But now, how do we discover in the world who's right and who's wrong when it comes to moral choices, when it comes to actions? Is it Mother Teresa who is the standard of goodness? Or is it Adolf Hitler who is the standard of evil? How do we decide? So we're going to dig a little deeper into this and we can figure it out. First thing we're going to do, and I need a few of you to answer me the following question. And it's pretty simple. I'm going to give you a couple of maps of Scotland. And I'm going to ask you which map is a better map or a better representation of Scotland. Map number one or map number two. Go ahead on and tell me which one do you think is a better map of Scotland? Number two? Number two. You got number two. Anybody else? Number one. Number one. Number two. I used to tell Carson, give me three. Give me three. Three thousand. Three eight thousand. Four thousand. Four thousand here. No, okay. So you guys are divided. How do you know? Which one is, the, is a better map of Scotland? How do you know? What do you need? A what? A standard. But what's that standard? A what? A real map. Oh, close. An actual Scotland. You need a place in reality called Scotland that you can reference that map with. So in order for you to say there anything is evil or anything is good, you got to have something that embodies perfect goodness. And that is God. And even though, sorry for the ones to say too, even though, <laughs> even though both maps are wrong in terms of accuracy, map number one is way more accurate. So it is not Mother Teresa. It is not Hitler who is the standard of morality. It's God's unchanging moral nature. His immutable nature is the standard for morality. It doesn't depend on you. It doesn't depend on me. It doesn't depend on emotions. And that's why we need him in order to be able to deem something right or wrong. We're not saying... That you don't know what's right or wrong. We're not saying that our friendly atheists don't know right from wrong. We are saying that for something to be truly right or truly wrong, ontologically, to use Sunday words like my friend here did earlier, right? Ontologically speaking, in order for right or wrong to truly exist, you need the standard. And the standard is God. Because every moral law needs a moral law giver. Right? It is not Mother Teresa, it is not Hitler, like I said. It is God's unchanging nature. So now what we're going to do, I'm going to give you a brief argument, syllogism for morality. And you're starting to see how the problem of evil kind of evaporates. And now I'm going to tell you something very important. You need to understand that when you, do the, when you talk about the problem of evil, you have to be very careful because a person like me that had gone through this difficult situation in my life you come and tell me that the problem of evil is so logical and philosophical that it's easy to answer and and i am in the middle of some heart-wrenching situation that's not going to help me that's going to make me angrier so you have to approach the problem of evil from an emotional and pastoral perspective and then the philosophical perspective, which is what I'm giving you now. So you don't go to your grieving cousin or your, 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 your grieving uncle or aunt and you give them this presentation. There you just tell them, you know what, I'm here to listen. You lend them an ear. So this is for us to think deeper into this situation but not for us to go and administer to other people right because this is not the way they do it okay so now we're going to look at the syllogism all right so premise number one it's that every law has a lawgiver premise number two there is an objective moral law and like i said it's very simple 
to show that this is the case, right? We, we, we saw the picture with the baby, the picture with the grandma, and actually we realized that a, a morality is objective not by our actions, but by our reactions, right? If you said, hey, you know what? Um, stealing is not wrong because I need to feed my family. But the moment somebody punch you in the face and take your iPhone, you will say, oh, stealing is wrong. So your reactions really show how objective good and evil are. So there is an objective moral law and we all live by it, whether we, we, we believe it or not. And therefore there is an objective moral law giver, right? So this is the way that we come to the conclusion that there is a, a moral law giver. But how is this moral law giver God? Well, as I said before, good, perfect good needs to exist. And this is what we call God. And especially in the scriptures, you fi we find that God is perfectly good. So we can make that. And there's a, way of, a bunch of other reasons why we get there. We're not going to get into, uh, into those reasons here right now because we're talking about the problem of evil and morality. But rest assured that there's many ways to show these attributes of God for, from, from intellectually rich arguments like this one. All right? So now... We understand that um, my aunt's murder is going to be justly dealt with because he killed himself. So he was not tried, you know. Now, I don't know if he had a last minute conversion and people will be like, that would be unjust if he convert in the last second. Well, no, because Jesus took that punishment on himself. So it is not unjust. You see how the problem of evil gets solved in this belief system we call Christianity, in this religion, in this worldview. But no other worldview have that answer. If we look <laughs> at Dr. Dawkins, how he's kind of uh, talking on both sides of his mouth, right? He talks about nor any justice, right? He says, there is no evil, there is no good. But then he goes later and says that I have always said that I am a fervent anti-Darwinist when it comes to the way we should organize our lives and our morality. We want to avoid establishing our society on Darwinian principles. Why? Because if we live in Darwinian principles, there's nothing that should stop me from killing Eric and raping his wife because that's the survival of the fittest, right? So Dawkins knows that. So he leaves as if morality was objective. And he don't want society to be based on Darwinian principles because he knows it's a, a dog-eat-dog -dog world, right? Actually, it's funny because he claims that objective morality does not exist. And at the same time, he tries to impose his own moral codes and duties and obli as, as obligations. And we all do that, especially with our children. You know, my kids are 14 and 15, and they have perfect logic, okay, right now. And they have a better set of standards for us as parents to follow, right? We all do that. since we, People say, well, you know, I don't, I don't think we're born sinful. Have you ever seen a two-year-old? Uh, you're crazy. If you haven't, I mean, it is built in, right? And then... Dawkins also claims that neither good nor evil exists. We just dance to the, the rhythm of our DNA. But on the other hand, he lives in an indignation at the evil God of the Bible. So we realize that the problem of evil completely falls apart when we start looking, just probing a little deeper at the logic in what the features of reality are, right? Morality and evil would be impossible if atheism, which is fundamentally materialistic, materialistic, were true. All moral judgments, all injustice and tragedy, and all evil would be reduced to an insignificant personal opinion. And the objectivity of morality depends on God. Now, this is a super cool cover of the uh, Stealing from God book in Spanish that I decided not to change because I was translating this talk like in the wee hours of yesterday before catching my plane, but that is even better than the English cover. And actually, you can go deeper into this in a book uh, written by my friend and mentor, Dr. Uh, Frank Turek. It's called Stealing from God, Why Atheists Need God to Make Their Case. But here, we cannot escape the conclusion 
that what corresponds to reality is objective morality, and without it, you know, there would be no evil. And that the fact that there is evil in the world show us that God must exist because he is the standard of perfect goodness. So we see the atheists inevitably have to steal from God, steal morality and the fact that evil exists, you know, to show that he doesn't, but it doesn't work for them because God and his attributes actually put forward what reality is. And actually, if we look at how things is structured, um, anything, anything that, any act that departs from the goodness of God is what we call evil. And anything that brings us closer, you know, to the way God wants us to behave. Our design, he used the word teleology, our final, final goal as a human being. It's not only to be with God and make him known, but to be more like his own Jesus Christ. So anything like that that brings us closer to God is what we call good, especially in the moral category. So there is no problem of evil if there is no God. We see the atheists steal from God in order to argue against him. So are these arguments for God, especially the argument for morality and evil that we just seen? Are these arguments for atheism? No, they are all arguments in favor of God's existence. And I wish I could do an all day seminar and go through each one of them, because then you will have a, a foolproof case against the non-existence of God and a, a robust understanding of the existence of God. And then those three out of four kids in the auditorium, in your churches, in your Sunday schools, will not leave the faith. So we know that right now we're talking about evil. Point to the existence of a creator and is grounded in him. Atheists who use them or the problem of evil in their arguments to commit intellectual, commit intellectual crimes by using these aspects of reality since without God, evil and morality would not exist. Now there is an answer for the problem of evil. There is a problem and there is an answer for my aunt's murder and my uncle's suicide and the suffering that we've been put through and the suffering you've been put through. And he is the answer. He solves the problem of evil. There is no other worldview to do that. No matter how long and how deep you dig and how long you search, he is the answer. He solved the problem of evil. And he's the only answer. And if you don't know him, then I suggest you get to know him. Because evil is going to knock at your door. Everybody here is going to see their loved ones die of disease, accident, maybe even, like my aunt, murder. And the only thing that is going to prevent you from that is you dying of any of those things. So just think about it. Thank you very much. And if you want to know more, I'm not like uh, Eric. I'm not going to sell you anything. Amen. Uh, I do have hungry kids, but I work. I'm a tent maker like Paul. Amen. Uh, so you can take some pictures there. Actually, you go to crossexamine.org. We have tons of free resources. Uh, and we do have online courses and a bunch of other stuff. I just, you know, like a good millennial with ADHD, I didn't bring anything, don't have a table or anything like that. And it looks like we have good time for Q&A. So, Eric, if you want to join me up here, get a handheld mic and we do a Q&A. That'll be great. Um, and if anybody who wants to make uh, questions, I don't know if those are hot mics. Those are good. Good deal. Yes. We'll have one there. Yeah, just come on and uh, let me get this for him. Test. Here you go. There. Come help. Yeah. For come on. Yeah, man. Yeah. So remember, I have my CDs and DVDs back. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir.
All right, I guess I'll start with this question. Why does morality or good in itself have to be placed on a being? On a being. Yeah, okay, that's, I've heard this argument, right? Because why can good just be like a place? Out there, like platonic, like yes, the forms. Exactly. Okay, yeah, that's really good. And what's your name? My name is Jacob. Jacob, okay. Jacobo. Jacobo. Yeah, yes. Um, so, because when we have the moral categories, right? And you can stay there so we can interact in case, in case we need to. Um, but when we have these types of moral categories, uh, they can only be applied to, to, to persons, right? And, and I'm talking about just human persons with bodies. It could be, you know, just like immaterial beings. It can be a person, you know, like God, right? Personal beings. I don't have, actually, let's use Eric as an example. He doesn't have a obligation to his Kia soul, you know? Like I have a Kia soul too. It's a little older than his and his is tricked out. It's got all the bells and whistles with the with the with the sporty line um but i have an old uh kia soul and uh it's 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 old and i don't take care of it very well right i don't change the oil when i need to but the I, mean, I don't have an obligation to that vehicle to treat him well i mean i'd, I'd be stupid if i don't do it because it, it can break down i already did before right so because it's an impersonal being but obligations, I, I ought to not punch you in the face, right? Because it, that, that won't be a good thing. It will be an immoral act. I mean, it, if, if you attack me, then I can punch you in the face. But, but that's different. That's self-defense, right? But when you're talking about moral categories, you only have moral obligations to, to persons. So the ultimate moral standard has to hinge on a person. And when we look at God's attributes, when we kind of extract these attributes from purely philosophical, um, purely philosophical uh, arguments, you know, we can get to a theistic God, a God who is personal, all-powerful, all-knowing, spaceless, timeless, immaterial. For example, the cosmological argument tells you the space, time, and matter came to exist in a finite point uh, in the past at the same time. So the, the cause for space, time, and matter needs to be spaceless, timeless, and immaterial. You know, when you know about morality, right and wrong, and you have duties to other people, right, this can only come to a person. you got duties, moral duties to persons. You don't have moral duties to objects. So you can conclude that the uh, source of this morality has to be personal, and that's why we ascribe it to God. Want to add something? To yeah, it? yeah. So briefly, so when you look at, so in a field called metaphysics, uh, another one of those branches in philosophy, by looking at the properties and attributes of a thing, it will elude or point to the kind of thing that possesses it. So when I talked about consciousness, I noted it was immaterial because of its properties. Now the next, in my case for the soul, DVD back there, twenty dollars. Um, <laughs> I, I show how that if we know consciousness exists and is immaterial, then the next question is what possesses it. It can't be the brain without going into the details, so you would need an immaterial substance, namely the soul. By the same token, when you look at the properties of morality, we know that properties of morality such as love, justice, kindness, loyalty are properties that are intrinsic to person, not objects. This table cannot be loyal, just, or kind. He can. So he is what grounds his moral principles. But in order for it to be objective, it has to be beyond him. Otherwise, it's just subjective and dependent on him. So it follows from just that one thing I said, that if objective morality exists and it cannot be grounded in him because it's subjective, then we need something objective of something that can ground morality and by its properties must be something personal, eternal, and necessary. Guess who that sounds like? God. Mm. Without God, there is no objective morality. You need a personal being that is necessary and eternal to ground this in. That would be God. Okay, thank you. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, you'd communicated, both of you, um, during your talks today, that when people communicate regarding um, like things of God's judgment of sin in the Old and New Testaments, that they maybe sometimes don't even use their objection to that to say, oh, God does not exist, but it's, I reject a God that would enact such judgment um, because, because I don't agree with that mm -hmm. judgment. However, when you, were, when you were both communicating, you said, well, Everyone has agreement at the end of the day that there is objective moral law because of the examples you gave about the grandma and the baby. And so I guess when someone objects, well, I reject the God of the Bible that would judge sin. 
would it, do you think that it would be an, one of the appropriate responses we could give is, well, do you, do you not agree that there are such things that are objectively wrong morally and that there is, and the right thing to do would be to judge yeah. that sin? Yeah. Um, and so I guess, what do you think about, I guess, communicating that as one of the responses to those objections? Well, it's good. I think that uh, when, we, when we talk about morality, it's the, 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 the one thing that you cannot not know. Right, it's it's something that you're you 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 know since you're since you're since you're a little little kid, right? It is kind of jumps up at you when somebody takes something from you at the playground, right? So most people who reject this and even don't reject God, the existence of God, but the re, the existence of the concept of the Christian God, because all of these atrocities and all of these things that are uh, 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 kind of uh, 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 pin on him in the Old Testament. Um, Usually this happens, and that happens to me. I never questioned the existence of God. I just didn't care, right? And one of the main things is because we are unaware of our own depravity, right? There is a good, uh, good book by Clay Jones called If God, Why Evil? I think that's the name of it. And he goes through all the atrocities that we do. And once we realize, as, as humans, and once we realize our own depravity, our own sinfulness, it's easier to see how we should... Um, expect justice you know justice is no deed go unpunished right uh, and of course god takes on you know this this culpability and then we can be reconciled with him you know through christ so um i think it's a good way to talk uh, one of the things that that we have to let them see is that, that we are all guilty and that's the hardest part it's just like a drug addict you know i did drugs until i was about 27 28 years old and it wasn't until i realized that i needed help right i'm, I'm 39 now so it's been re fairly recently a decade or so um and it wasn't until i realized that i needed help that i, that I was seeking help right in the same way they're not going to be open to the idea of a god who will snuff a, a whole group of people out which really was hyperbolic in, in a certain sense but uh um let figure out a way to show them um, and, and i know i don't i don't agree with this guy a lot uh in terms of the way he do things but he uses a technique his name is ray comfort and he goes with a little camera and a, and a microphone right and uh, and he shows people their own sinfulness by their own admission without pushing it because we have all stolen something or look at somebody we lost or or uh, we have lied. So it, th those are th those are big three in the Ten Commandments, right? Ten words. So that's that's very very telling of where we are. And if you tell people, oh, you mad at God because he you know, was uh, eliminated the Canaanites. So they had that mandate, they eliminated the Canaanites after 400 years of them having, you know, sodomy and bestiality and child sacrifice and all of these other things. Uh, but if he, uh, that's when he took matters into his own hands. If you will ask God to destroy evil right now, neither, neither one of us will be here. So show, to figure out a way to show them uh, that, let them uh, help them see inside of themselves and because they will not t it doesn't matter what argument you know you give them or what reason you give them they're not going to be open to it until they realize their own sinfulness they're not going to seek help yeah uh, and and briefly it, it would depend who's who i'm talking to but there's kind of two things on the table here one does god exist two if he did exist should we worship him and I would kind of even then break those down even more so with the person. But the first thing I'd say is, as George is presenting, um, I, I like how Moreland once put it, evil is a deviation of good. So like you said, you cannot have, you can have sunshine without shadows, but if you have shadows, therefore there's a sunshine. If, if I tell someone they're lying, I am insinuating they are deviating from truth. So same principle. As he was explaining earlier, evil is a deviation of good. So if you... If goodness needs an objective moral standard, which we've already you know, talked about in he, the presentation that it must be God, then it follows that if evil exists, therefore God exists. So I usually tell people, before I answer your question, can you first please tell me if you're still an atheist? Because if there's no God, there's no evil. But if you're mm -hmm. telling me this is evil, then God exists. So which one do you want to go with? I start there. Whatever they answer from there, and I say, okay, now let's look at the God of the Bible. Um, as he was saying, you know, some of, some of the language is hyperbolic. For those, uh, there's a great book called "Is God a Moral Monster" by Paul Copen. Um, but essentially, again, lots we could say, but to keep it brief, if God is not just all powerful but all loving, all knowing, 
knows every outcome, not just what will happen, but what would happen, what could happen, X, Y, and Z, then perhaps he knows something I don't. Mm -hmm. um, and here's the illustration I'll, I'll end with that I like to use when I, when I touch on this topic. My son, he's five now. When he was younger, he hated sitting in the car seats. He hated it. You would put him in there, he'd cry. Now, when he was born, I, held, I was the first to hold him. I said, you, you call out to me any time. I'm your dad. I will be there for you. Then we started putting him in car seats, and guess what? He cried out, and I wasn't there. Imagine the confusion. Could I sit and explain to him, look, son, based on the legislative laws of the United States of America and the Texas branch, not going to fly. So guess what I do? As a good parent, I get in the front seat and I drive, and I stomach the crime. I think sometimes that we cry out in life to God, I think we're just in car seats. And I think we just don't realize that. But if I know in whom I trust, as David said, I may not know why you're doing this, but I trust you. Amen. Because I have reason to. Yeah. Thank you. Hey guys, how's it going? Howdy. Um, What's your name? Uh, Jeremy. Jeremy. Uh, my question is going to be kind of, um, uh, I, 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 it's going to be like a, I don't know, a trick question. I'm just going to, but, uh, Thank you for warning us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, um, it, okay, w w without using a biased source such as the Bible, and w w without uh, saying, well, you just got to have faith, can you explain to me um, the resurrection of Jesus? Because history says, uh, an unbiased source, history says, Jesus was born. History says Jesus died. But I, I think uh, the greatest, you know, question is uh, history. I don't think history tells us, you know, Jesus was resurrected. Uh, and that, and that y'all can help me out there. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean by an unbiased source? Well, I, what, what I mean by bias and unbiased is because. Uh, a bias source says, well, Jesus um, was resurrected, the Bible. Unbiased, um, basically, the Jews that hated Jesus say, no, no, it was his followers. So who can, I mean, who's right here? Right, but I think that there is a presupposition that anything written by a Christian is biased. So you need to avail yourself, uh, disavow yourself of that presupposition because that's not how history worked. Also, history wasn't written the same way that it is written now, right? So they were a bit more of a different take on how you write history, right? Um, also, there are a bunch of extra biblical sources that can be used to compile this wizard, the race from, that was, they, they came back from the dead that we call Jesus of Nazareth, right? So what you have to do is first realize why is it that it, because it comes from Christians is biased. For example, let's say I send my, my daughter goes to a tutoring school, right? It's a small school. It's sort of like a German concept. It's five students per, per little, little classroom. And they're all in different, in different uh, grades, and then it, it, they go at their own pace. Uh, if the math book that she's using is written by an atheist, I'm going to say, oh, no, that, that's, that's biased math. It's not, you know, because the contents on the book are objectively delivered, right? And it's the same thing. If these were eyewitness events of this hi historical moment of Jesus coming back from the dead, right, it doesn't matter what, actually, the, it, it, whether there were believers or non-believers, even the brother of Jesus, who was an unbeliever, ended up being not only martyred, but being the head of the church in uh, Jerusalem, right? So you have to uh, analyze your own bias before posting the, the question, because really you can look at extra biblical sources and the biblical sources in scholarship and biblical scholarship. Uh, people don't discount. Uh, I will say pop scholars of 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 the sort that that don't they're not taken seriously will say that you cannot use any christian sources but most scholars whether they're skeptics or believers go to the biblical accounts to 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 see them as historical events now they discount the supernatural but that's their own bias they have their own reasons so you have to just be careful in how you even frame this in your mind because it really can taint your your um your perspective and your conclusions yeah so let's say we have two documents one says jesus rose from the dead the other says he didn't which one of them is not biased well they're both biased right there's nothing wrong with bias inherently right uh the question is is it true 
um, like he was alluding to. Uh, historians can look at a text, and there's ways to know whether or not something is reliable or credible historically. So Bart Ehrman is a New Testament non-believing scholar. He agrees with a lot of what we're saying, but of course discounts that he was risen from the dead. But then the question is, well, what's the explanation that you give? You know, never without going into too many details, I can give you something that is unbiased, which actually you yourself said, interestingly, coincidentally. We know historically speaking, what did the Jewish and Roman authorities say when the disciples said there was a resurrection and the tomb was empty? What did the Jewish and Roman authorities say? Well, you stole the body. Note what they're implicitly admitting. Gary Habermas, one of the world's leading scholars on the resurrection, says, when a boy tells his teacher the dog ate his homework, what is he implying? I don't have it. When your enemies say you stole the body, what are they implying? The tomb's empty. Mm -hmm. That is an unbiased source, historically known as enemy attestation. Historically speaking, when you have enemy attestation saying the same thing you're saying, although they give a different explanation, they're admitting the tomb is empty. That's an unbiased source that says, hey, we need an explanation for this because something happened. Yeah. It's the resurrection. That's good. Thank you, Jeremy. Okay, thank you. And anybody else who has a question, we have about five minutes. So instead of having to go all the way from your seat here, line up <laughs> so we can get them through. So uh, what do you say to somebody who says, well, we have an all-powerful God and he's good. There's lots of evil in the world, lots of suffering. So why doesn't he, why doesn't he just prevent that? Okay, that's a big so one. that's good. Yeah, that's, and that's a big that's a big hurdle for a lot of people. And what's your name? Carrie. Carrie. Yes. All right, Carrie. So, uh, actually, um, no, number one, uh, when when we say, well, it's a lot of it's a lot of uh, uh, evil in the world, right? And it, it sometimes it's phrased like, why do good things happen? Uh, uh, bad things happen to good people. Well, number one, there are no good people. Right. No, none. I mean, there are none. I, I, he gave you the, the, the two-year-old example, right? So there are no good people, and the Bible is clear on that. Um, the other thing is that there was a good man, and a lot of horrible things happened to him, and God didn't stop it. That was Jesus of Nazareth, right? So we, we make these things clear, right? Um, also, he can't stop it. But one of the, the, one of the greatest, if not the greatest virtue is love. And love, for love to exist, you got to have free will. You have to have the ability to choose otherwise. Uh, my wife uh, wakes up every morning and makes, she makes a conscious choice to love me, even with all my flaws. I'm self-centered. I, I, I grew up as a, as a single true. child. Yes, true, yeah. <laughs> single child, you know, all of these things. So I'm always looking to do what I want, what I want, and how I want it, right? And, uh, and she chooses to still love me, and it's a choice that she makes every day. Uh, but in order for that to be uh, real, it has to be uh, uh, a, 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 a freely, you know, uh, choice, uh, a free choice. Now, if God would prevent all evil, he will have to create uh, robots. Uh, and I, I'm big on sci-fi. I actually was talking earlier uh, uh, to, to a fellow that um, the, the debate on free will is the best represented on sci-fi, you know, things like the Borgs, you know, uh, uh, in, in Star Trek, right, or Terminator, right, or all of these other things. And, um, and, and free will is given a, a big price, right? If, if God wanted to stop all evil, he'd just create robots out of us, but then true love is not uh, possible. And if that is the highest virtue, God wants us to come to him and to love him freely. You know, and he has, you know, there is a, this idea of the hiddenness of God. He has to give us just enough in order not to, to overexpose himself to then ban our free will. It will not be free will anymore, and we won't be able to freely choose him, in a sense, right? So it is because of love that we have this choice, and then because of this choice that evil exists. If he does away with all evil, if he prevents it, me and you will be robots. Yeah, so um, I, I like what, what uh, Turk, your mentor, uh, friends of ours, uh, what he says. He says, if you want God to stop and prevent all evil, well, watch out because he might start with you. Would you? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I find it interesting that, uh, so with non-believers in particular, you know, they complain, why doesn't God stop evil? 
Well, in Genesis 6, he sent a flood and he stopped evil, and then they complained that he didn't. Right. <laughs> so which, which, do you want him to stop it or do you want him to not stop it? God, kill, God allows the killing of people. We say, oh, he shouldn't do that. And then we have women paraded around saying, I should be able to kill my baby. It's also another issue. Nevertheless, just because God has not now stopped evil doesn't mean he will. He will not one day. And even then, and I've heard uh, Frank say this, God's not going to quote-unquote destroy evil. He's going to quarantine it. That's what hell mm -hmm. is. It's a separation. So even in eternity, evil will still exist because he respects you enough to respect your decision. Say, if you don't want me, that's fine, but I will have to quarantine you. And I'll lastly say this. Think of evil like a deprivation or lack of. When I, when I am hungry, it is because there is a lack of food in my stomach. How do I get rid of hunger? Not by taking it out. You by going to Taco Bell. It is by going. That's the most truest thing you said all morning. Is you go to Taco Bell and they just brought back the Mexican pizza and you get at least two of those. So to get rid of evil, guess what I do? I add in food. I add in what it lacks. If evil is a lack of God and a lack of good, how do we get rid of it? You add God in. That Thank requires you. us to be a Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Good job, absolutely.